I love it when, in, in a certain sense, someone from the other side crosses over. That is, especially in the area of Darwinian evolution, which I, I reject on the merits themselves. I don't reject it because I'm a Christian. Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to believe that. Because there are a lot of Christians who do believe it. Now, I think they believe it in a way that creates problems for their Christianity. But I just, I'm just letting you know that I, I, I'm not closing my eyes to science because I have a Bible that tells me to do so. I think Darwinism fails on the merits. And this is why it's so satisfying when someone who is steeped in that tradition makes a change, and makes a change principally because of the merits. That is, the the reasons in favor of Darwinian evolution, he realized, are not persuasive. But in fact, something else is going on to keep that paradigm alive, and that is actually two things in my view, and he does speak to it. It is the power of a paradigm that is driven principally by a philosophy. And uh, that's the philosophy of materialism. And the power of a paradigm, I'm sorry, the, the power of a reigning paradigm, which that refers simply to the power of people in power who have the ability to cut off debate when it isn't going their way. And uh, when he slowly became aware of both of those things, and, well, I should say three of those those three things, which includes the problem with the, the merits of the case for Darwinism itself, that's when he decided eventually to jump ship. Now, part of his critique, um, he had dismissed uh, the, 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 so, the, the intelligent design model, let's put it that way, he had dismissed it because this was just simply another example of God of the gaps. That is, the way this objection is frequently characterized, is that you guys just don't know what happened, and so you stick God in that gap of knowledge. Okay? That's what's called the God of the gaps. And what what he came to realize at some point is that the God of the Gaps criticism, this is one of the things that he realized that helped turn his mind around, is the God of the Gaps criticism cuts both ways. Because a functional atheist could also insert their materialistic appeal or explanation in any knowledge gap. And this is exactly what happens. I, I, I hear it from Michael Shermer all the time, uh, American Atheist, Skeptic Magazine, evolutionist, um, who says, in the face of daunting evidence against Darwinism, will say, and, and this is p particularly at a couple of specific points, like the origin of life and then the develop, development of life into different life forms, he'll simply say, why can't we just say we just don't know? Why can't we just say we just don't no. Now, there's an appeal there to the gap. We don't know. Okay, we don't need to put God in that gap. Why can't we just say we just don't know? And, of course, what he means is we just don't know now because he's convinced that we will know eventually because eventually science will fill the gap with a naturalistic ep explanation, so there's no need to appeal to God. Now, here's the problem with that approach. Um, first of all, it it is guilty of what it is criticizing. It is criticizing a God of the gaps. He's sticking a scientific question mark in there. He's sticking something in there to plug the hole. He doesn't know what it is, but he's, he's sure that it's something naturalistic that will eventually be able to explain it. So this is just like, the, like uh, 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 Matty Lesola says, this God of the Gaps criticism can cut both ways because the atheist is going to put his own thing in the gap, that is, his faith in naturalism, okay? 
And that brings me to the second problem with this God of the Gaps appeal, is that this is circular. How is it circular? Circularity is when you're assuming what needs to be proved. Well, what are they assuming? They're assuming that the gap will be filled with some naturalistic explanation because there must be one. But of course, that's the whole thing in question here, whether naturalistic explanations are adequate to explain everything. And when you look at some of these gaps, they seem to be so profound that even in principle, a naturalistic explanation is not going to be adequate. Yet if you assume naturalism, there must be one, then you can readily place that naturalistic question mark in the gap, meaning we don't know the naturalistic answer, but we do know there is one we will find eventually. So not only is are they playing God of the Gaps in reverse, but they are also assuming what needs to be proved that naturalism is adequate to fill every gap. But here's the third problem. The ID folk will say when it comes to these kinds of things, there is no gap. There's no gap of knowledge. We know, based on the existing evidence, what caused that thing. Because all of the evidence points to an agent who caused that thing. How do we know that? Because we know how agency works. You know why? Because we are one. Ones. We are agents. And we know that certain things are the result of agents making decisions to act in a certain way and invent and build and develop things with know-how. That is, they use know-how to develop these things. We know how to recognize when something is so intricately fashioned that it requires know-how for it to function the way it functions. That means there is no gap of explanation. We have an explanation that is entirely adequate. It just doesn't fit the philosophy that is being forced upon us. There's another, and this is why, by the way, the point is made here that uh, with regard to this book, Heretic, that um, there is a naturalistic evolutionary faith that is doing a lot of work. And by faith, I mean what they mean by faith. That means what you put your trust in something, you have no good reason to do it. It's not what I mean by faith. It's not what the Bible means by faith, but it's what the atheists define faith as, and that fits here. Because they are faith in a process that is not adequate to the task, there is an evidence to show that the process they're having faith in can accomplish what they need it to accomplish. And one of those is massively the origin of life. And one of the points made here in the book Heretic is that that the knowledge gap is not shrinking. It isn't like all these gaps what used to be big and we didn't know how it worked, and now we realize science, well, all of these gaps are shrinking. Well, many of them are as we learn more, but there are certain gaps that are regular and systematic that are not getting smaller, they're getting larger because of the nature of the gap. And I just mentioned one of those, and that's the origin of life. You know, life, even its most simplest, is so massively complex. Every single cell is like a small city in its complexity and all the things that it does. And it, it, is, it is just not judicious to presume that all of these things happen by any kind of accident, but especially the accident of genetic mutation and natural selection. It's not adequate to do the job. And the more that we find out about these things, the bigger these gaps get, making, by the way, the agency explanation to fill the gap with an explanation, not a G-O-D word, to fill the gap to bridge the gap with an explanation that fits the available evidence, why that is becoming more and more persuasive. Because it does such a good job, and these other naturalistic gaps are growing, um, growing by leaps and bounds. 
in any event, um, this uh, this scientist, um, Matty uh, Lesola, um, in the process of not only looking at the evidence and realizing how much gain, how much of the of the model, the Darwinian model, is is being propped up by the power of a philosophic paradigm, naturalism, and seeing evidence to the contrary, um, th- this is what began to drive him to be a heretic to that point of view. So I'm glad for people like this because what they are saying more and more is that, first, this is something that on the merits, the point that I started with, doesn't have the chops to stand up on its own. But because of a, a, a power play grounded in a philosophic paradigm, uh, naturalism, uh, the, the paradigm of Darwinism is not allowed to be challenged. It's protected. Why does it need to be protected? Because it can't stand up on its own. Or as Richard uh, Lewontin said famously in the New York Review of Books a number of years ago, um, he's a Harvard geneticist and uh, obviously a Darwinist. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. It's It's not about following the evidence where it leads, they point out here in this book. It's about the power of a paradigm. And I have asked many times, do you want the right answers or do you want the right kinds of answers? And that's the question I think any scientist in this field has to struggle with. Do you want the right answers, that is, the facts of how this actually took place, without just dismissing things because you don't like it? Or you want to call it religion rather than science? If the scientific methodologies are in place, if the points of view are well justified, it shouldn't matter whether it is a naturalistic answer or not. So do you want the right answers, or do you demand the right kinds of answers, those answers that comport with uh, naturalism, materialism, and physicalism? That's the question.